Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Born to Read, a sub-segment of Born to Reign. Um, this week we're following up our episode from last week on postmillennialism, our historical optimism, and we're following it up with a book that we highly recommend um, by the late Greg Bonson. It's called Victory in Jesus, yep. The Bright Hope of Postmillennialism. Um, we just passed the 25 year anniversary of Greg Bonson's death. Um, so, and then in light of our episode on postmillennialism uh, last week, we thought this would be a good reference. Um, this isn't, this was a book, it's a collection of essays by Bonson, um, just kind of laying the groundwork for what is postmillennialism. I know a lot of people. Uh, today, it's not a super widely held position, um, but it is. So, with that, it comes with a lot of misconceptions, mischaracterizations, um, and so he kind of is laying out here just a basic definition for here's what it is. This isn't a, an apologetics book. This isn't a a book that's just like super in depth, um, but very helpful in just mm -hmm. framing. If you want to. Um, even if you disagree, it, it's helpful to look at it and go, okay, now I know what post-millennialism is. Yeah. Um, I think, Jeremiah, you were the one who recommended this one to me. Yeah. Um, we've both read it. Um, so if you want to just jump in, what, what's the what's the structure of this book? Where, where do we um, launch off into it here? Well, this book is actually a, a collection of essays. Um that are put together into a book and they're essays that Bonson wrote. Uh, I think it's edited by Randy Booth, who I think actually sent me this book. So if you happen to listen to this, thank you, Mr. Booth. Uh, but it's, it starts out chapter one is just understanding the book of Revelation. And his main point is that the book of Revelation is called the book of Revelation, meaning that it's not meant to conceal it's meant to reveal things. We're supposed to understand it. Right. It's meant to be understood, and it can be understood. And that reminds me of a funny uh, comment by G.K. Chesterton. He's like, in, in John's visions, he saw many horrible things, but nothing so horrible as one of his commentators. <laughs> <laughs> or um, Ambrose Bierce, who said, um, the book of Revelation is the book where St. John the Divine revealed all he knows. Um, it was the commentators who... Uh, it's the commentator, or no, no, sorry. Gosh, that's just awful. <laughs> Rewind, start over. Um, he says, the book of Revelation is where St. John the Divine concealed all he knew. It's the commentators who do the revealing who know nothing. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. Okay, so chapter two goes to the millennial question. This is where he describes dispensational premillennialism, premillennialism, amillennialism, and postmillennialism, and kind of gives a quick rundown on them yeah chapter three he starts to kind of describe why postmillennialism is the correct view chapter three is called the triumph of the gospel and hence the name victory in jesus so he starts to explain how the gospel is going to win through history how that's taught in scripture chapter four is a very long chapter it's more of an academic essay it's kind of like ramping up uh it's called the prima facie acceptability of postmillennialism it's a very, uh, it's an amazing essay on the just why you should accept postmillennialism. Uh, one of the, he, he's, if you've never heard of Greg Bonson, he's, he, he was brilliant. He was a, like a master logician. He was a debater. He was a critical thinker. He had two PhDs. The dude was uber, uber smart. You don't want to meet that guy in the back in, in, in a dark intellectual alley. You, you just don't want to mess no. with them. So, but he, he goes and dismantles every single, he really does. He just dismantles every single system except for post-millennialism uh, because it's, it's, uh, he, he ends up kind of picking apart every single one and shows that post-millennialism is the last one standing at the end of the day. Well, and, and even more than that, I think when he's, even the title of that chapter the prima facie acceptability of postmillennialism is he's really setting out um, to say postmillennialism, though today is a kind of a minority position, um, deserves a seat at the table. 
and so a lot of people will dismiss, um, especially in today's you know in, in today's America where it's dominated by a premillennial dispensational uh, eschatology. Um, postmillennialism is massively dismissed as crazy. Um, it you know you, you hear it's unbiblical. There's no way you can defend it from scripture. Right. Uh, there's no way. Uh, nobody's ever believed. Nobody's ever even heard of it. You know, most people when you talk to them today. Um, have not even heard of postmillennialism, and so the prima facie, uh, he goes back and kind of describes. Here, look through history, look at all these significant people who have held to this this position. Yeah, and it's it's an overwhelming the the list of names through history who who have espoused postmillennialism is staggering. Um, right, and he. It's just it's so it's so interesting. It's funny because we're we're seen as the minority now. Yeah. But if you look in history, up until eighteen twenty five, being premillennial was almost seen as like very, very weird. It yeah. was like not not to offend anybody here, but it really was just the minority position yeah. which crazy people held to. That that's just how that's what history tells us. That's until Edward Irving, who was the one to, who was an assistant to Thomas Char- Chalmers, who was just an amazing guy, um, Edward Irving read a book by a Roman Catholic priest from South America, and was and he kind of set forth a premillennial thought pattern. Edward Irving was attracted to that, and then he he began to he was also att- attracted to charismatic gifts, so he began to have these uh, uh, conferences. Uh, these conferences begetted more thinking. And uh, Bonson ends up saying, this is kind of a good summary. He says the Albury conferences, those are the conferences that Edward Irving set up, uh, perhaps by Irving himself, others claim that, he's talking about dispensationalism, that it originated in a tongues utterance by a member of Irving's church, and yet others attribute it to a prophetic vision experienced by a Scottish woman, Margaret MacDonald. Whatever the specific source, the relevant point is that the belief appeared and gained a popularity around 1830, being popularized in the publication of Darby's Dispensational Premillennialism. So the mere fact of the matter is that this was a historical anomaly. It is a historical anomaly. And then he goes on, and it's pretty funny because a lot of people try to play, we, we try to say, and I wish it was true, that there's no difference in the way that some somebody lives their life based on their eschatology. Right. And I wish that were true, but it's just not true. And it even says here, uh, F.W. Newton, who was a dispensationalist, an early one, said that the imminent return of Christ totally forbids all working for earthly objects distant in time. Uh, Zahn, also an early dispensationalist, criticized Calvin he said that Calvin made the mistake. He considered it his task to make the secular authorities submit it, submissive to his interpretation of divine commandments. Missions had to abandon the aim of establishing Christian, Christian institutions and, constant, and concentrate simply on the conversion of individual souls, as A.A. A. Hodge astutely observed. So, basically, the visible church was depreciated, its pastoral office deemed unnecessary, and its historic doctrine dis- disregarded by and dispensationalism by by dispensationalism by the early promoters mostly of dispensationalism and that that i just the prima facie chapter is so it's, a, it's just a giant like 60 pill. pages long yeah but and you can just find the the pdf online of just that i yeah, think the, the book itself is super helpful the complete book Mm-hmm. Um, but just to look at the, the prima facie, uh, acceptability of postmillennialism, um, is where he kind of walks, really does walk through and go, here's how postmillennialism compares to dispensational premillennialism. Here's how it compares to amillennialism. Here's how it compares to, um, historic premillennialism. And, and he, he, he compares it to each one, like you were saying, um, and proves that it, it deserves a place at the table. Um, right. And, and if you read this historical section in this essay, and you say, I understand that dispensationalism really has no historic roots, but I believe that it's purely biblical and I don't care what church history says. That's fine. Yeah. But you really got to grit your teeth and get through I think that. There, there's, a, there's a lot of good 
scholarship that comes from the dispensational side, uh, from the amillennial side, from a historic premillennial side. Like there, we're not, we would never say, and Bonson would never say that those people weren't Christian, that they weren't good godly men, good godly women who, who hold to these things. But when he's looking at an, a consistent interpretation and application of scripture, um, postmillennialism is the only consistent way that, that is consistent with all of scripture all the way through. Um, and, and plus it's way fun. I, and I think he ends, <laughs> uh, he ends that, the, the prima fascia, um, chapter with, um, like you can disagree with me. It's fine, but I just want you guys to know you can't, you can't blackball us anymore. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, you know, we have to, we have to be taken seriously. Um, it, it's going to be a force to be reckoned with. Um, plus, when, like I said, when we compare who's held to postmillennialism in the past, it's the it's the people who have had the greatest impact on the church. Um, Saint Athanasius, um, Augustine, um, Calvin, Luther, Jonathan Edwards. Jonathan Edwards is the most famous. Um, American theologian was a postmillennialist. Mm-hmm. John Knox. Like, the the post-millennial. list the list goes on. All of these guys were postmillennial. They believed that the gospel would triumph in history prior to Christ's return. John Owen. Uh, John Owen. I mean, <clears throat> so you've got all of these guys who held to this position. So it's so strange to look today and have this position get dismissed completely. Um, as though on generally on the pure basis of look at the world around us, how can things be so bad? Uh, we can't be living in the kingdom if this is the kingdom, um, which leads us to the last chapter of the book, which is the, uh, the, the current, uh, what, is, how does it, the person I mean, work, it, the person and work present and status. present status of, um, Satan, Satan. And that this is a killer chapter. It was your it was your favorite, wasn't it? Yes, it was. Was it yours? No, I like the prima fascia better. Okay, jerk. But <laughs> uh, anyways, <laughs> yeah this this is a this is a great chapter. It I learned so much about Satan. It, it's just like it was purely educational, like the worthless one. His name Belier. Like it's just steeped in scripture. This whole entire chapter. Yep. And. Uh, he ends up, so you, you start reading this and you're just like, okay, you're literally disproving everything you've said because you're just proving how bad Satan is. Well, and that's, that's the, the, the primary critique of post-millennialism is that Revelation 20 says that an angel comes out of heaven, binds Satan and throws him in the pit for a thousand years. And those who are resurrected with Christ ruled and reigned with Christ for a thousand years while Satan was bound. So the the main critique is to say, look at the world. Um, All this wickedness is going on. How can you possibly say that Satan is bound right now? And he goes through all of this. Here's who Satan is and to what extent is he bound? What does he look like? Mm -hmm. And he, um, in so doing, when he describes how powerful Satan was and what a grip he had on the world and how just evil he is, you start to like get this fear halfway through the chapter, but then as he turns to Christ in the prophecies about what Christ was going to do to Satan and how he, how the 70 comes back to him and they said like, we preach the gospel. And he's like, assuredly, I say to you, I saw Satan fall from heaven while you guys were preaching. He, he's, he, by showing us how evil Satan is, he shows us how great Christ is towards the end of the chapter. This chapter really was like a roller coaster. Because <laughs> yeah. you like through halfway, you're like, oh no, this is horrible. And then by the end of it, you're like, wow, Christ is even greater than I thought. Yeah. And he really establishes Jesus as the, um, the serpent crusher mm-hmm. and what Jesus death uh, accomplish. Um, and, and how important it was that his death accomplished um, this crushing of the serpent, which was promised to Adam and Eve in the garden. Um, and the, in doing this, uh, he accomplishes, 
he, uh, he accomplishes gaining the victory and the title deed to the world, uh, but he also crushes crushes the head of the serpent um, so that he is, uh, uh, Bonson says, based on this, the his, his discussion on the, the crushing of the head of the serpent, he says, based upon the foregoing study, we can conclude by pointing out that Satan is not the formidable foe to Christians and their great commission, which so many writers are making him out to be these days. His opposition must be taken seriously, of course. However, it is important that we do not let it defeat us in our sanctification, evangelism, or application of God's standards to every area of life. Because Jesus Christ has defeated and overcome Satan, so also shall Christ's people gain victory over Satan. His work is no real threat to the progress of God's kingdom. Satan has been bound by Christ, and now his house is being plundered. Mm. That's that's postmillennialism in a nutshell, right? So, because um, the binding of Satan is what Revelation twenty tells us that it's um, his ability to deceive the nations, and so his binding means that Christ's gospel goes forth. You can't stop it. Um, his his victory is certain, um, and though Satan is a a powerful opponent, um, he's not that powerful. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Uh, Bonson says, when Satan's persecution comes, it is Satan rather than believers who will be trod upon and defeated. For even martyrdom cannot rob the Christian of his victory. The faithful witness for Christ is more than a conqueror and always overcomes the wicked one. Victory over sin and preservation from its power and deadly effects are assured us. Satan cannot gain the upper hand over us even through physical threatening then. Bingo. I mean... I should read this book again. Yeah. I'm, I'm just kind of like flipping through, looking at yeah. my highlights. Like, oh man, I missed sections that I should have highlighted, but yeah. I highlighted sections that were just, oh my goodness. You're so going to read good. it again and so end good. up highlighting the entire book. Yeah. So what's your, what's your uh, rating on this? I'm going to give it an eight because it is pretty academic. Okay. Um, but I think it's not so academic that it's not accessible to other people. Um, and I think if you want to, if you want to understand post-millennialism, it's easy. It's it's a, a fairly easy read. Um, those two last chapters, the prima facie acceptability of postmillennialism and the person, work, and current status of Satan, are terrific chapters. Very long, very difficult to read in one sitting. So you have to you have to take it in pieces. Um, so, but overall, highly recommend. I think it's good. What about you? I give it a ten. Ten. I can't. I just. I I can't find anything wrong with it. It's academic but it's not so academic to where I wouldn't recommend it to the normal person who can read. He was a terrific lecturer. I mean, so when these are coming from lectures and essays of his, I mean, he was an excellent communicator, excellent writer. So it's so, it's so, it's a very, very good book. Mm -hmm. Um, So eight or nine is where I'd leave it. You've got a 10. Highly recommend. Book again, Victory in Jesus, The Bright Hope of Postmillennialism by the late, great... Dr. Greg Bonson. Mm -hmm. Check it out uh, wherever books are sold. We will catch you guys next time. On the flippity flop.